I worked as a substance abuse counselor and recovery life coach at a drug and alcohol rehab center. Because I'm the new guy, I got stuck with the 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. group therapy sessions. One evening, after I'd finished the last group therapy session for the day, I went back to my office to type up some notes, which typically would take me 30 to 40 minutes. Since most of our substance abuse clients also had criminal records, and because we kept various controlled substances locked up at the facility, I had to walk through the entire building to ensure that every door and window was locked up tight before I left up for the night. My office was at the end of the hall past the front desk, which meant someone could quietly come into the office and I wouldn't have known it until they were practically in my office with only a window to escape. Given the caliber of some of our clients, I always carried a concealed 9mm handgun and always locked the front door any time I had to work alone at night. One particular night, I was sitting at my desk typing up my report when I heard the sound of footsteps in the office above me. The footsteps were heavy and sounded like a grown man walking around. No, better it actually sounded as if he was stomping around in the office above me. Since everyone else left for work at 5, I knew... I was completely alone that particular night. Again, I heard the footsteps above my office. So I thought to myself, fantastic, someone's broken into the office and I've got to be the one to go and confront them. I got up, pulled out my Glock 19, and began doing tactical clearing of the building, and quietly working my way up the stairs. As I neared the doorway at the top of the stairs, I checked the office to my left, then the bathroom next to it and glanced down the hallway to the office where I heard those sounds coming from. I had a decision to make, clear the rooms to my right, or continue down the hallway toward the area where I heard someone. So I opted to head towards the potential threat, and then complete my sweep in a clockwise pattern. Quietly glided down the hall, continually checking my six until I got to the office, and stealthily tried the doorknob. Locked. So I leaned in, and listened at the door. Nothing. Turning to my right, I slipped down the hallway towards the group therapy room. Nothing. Then, I nearly pissed myself. Finally, I had to check one last place. The recovery room where we put clients who were going through detoxing. I raised my 9mm, peeked around the corner of the room. And what I saw nearly made me piss my pants. In the semi-darkness of the room, sitting on the couch in front of me was what appeared to be a dead woman with a blanket draped over her head and body. Every nerve in my body coursed with electricity as adrenaline jumped into my system. I quietly looked behind me. Nothing. Then I turned back and spoke deliberately to the figure I saw sat in front of me. I got a gun, and you've got three seconds to very slowly pull that blanket down so I can see you. If you don't, I'm gonna shoot you. Do you understand me? Nothing. I repeated louder. I am going to shoot you and kill you unless you slowly pull the blanket down so I can see you. Do you understand? Nothing. I glanced behind me one last time then cautiously stepped forward with one hand. And I quickly yanked the blanket off and stepped back, ready to let the air out of whomever or whatever was stupid enough to not comply with my orders. Nothing. Nothing but a bunch of couch throw pillows someone had stacked and then casually threw a blanket over, landing just right. With my heart racing, I checked behind me, then hauled tail downstairs, packed up my stuff, and got the same hell out of there. The next day, when everyone got to the office, I casually mentioned what had happened to me to a few other employees. They were all unimpressed. Oh, you finally met one of our ghosts, huh? Uh, what? Ghosts in the plural? Yeah, there's an upper half of an old man some have seen sitting at our desk doing office work. He never really bothers us, just kind of freaks you out when you walk into your office and see him. Don't worry about him, it's normal. When we see him, he just vanishes. Oh, and there's a little girl you can occasionally hear bouncing a ball. She runs up and down the hallway upstairs as well. They recited all this to me, nonchalantly, like it's no big deal. Like they were reciting a page from the Farmer's Almanac. Just another day, right? To give some context of where this story is based, 
I live in a smallish college town near a small to medium sized city. The town itself doesn't really have a lot of people and is mostly here to cater to demand that comes from the college. Because of this, the stores around the college are mostly open 24 7 so that the college kids will be able to impulse buy whatever they like. The other big seller around here is gas. Of course, gas can be bought in the city, but being a town that has often gone through in order to get to the city, a lot of places will try to keep the price slightly lower than any other stations inside the city. This is where my story begins, working overnights in a gas station slash liquor store, when I was doing part-time classes in college myself, but most of them were online so they wouldn't ruin my availability for a full-time job. The store that I worked at had only one person working on overnights for a long time. Even though a lot of people, especially girls, would complain of the lack of cameras and the fact that you don't always get the best people coming into a liquor store in the middle of the night. The owner's hand was forced one night before I started working there. A woman came in to buy milk and went outside to her car, only for a man to come up behind her, shove a gun in her back and demand her money. She complied with him, and luckily, he let her go. She ran into the store, sobbing hysterically. Police showed up shortly thereafter, but he was never found. Myself personally, I like having two people on, even if there wasn't a safety issue. The nights seem to go by much faster when there's someone else there, and it was really nice that a person I normally worked with got along so well. So overall, there were only four overnight shift workers, Josh, Nick, Dixie, and myself. Dixie had another job and was really only working there as a favor to one of the managers. She would only work two nights a week, either with Josh or myself. Josh and I worked together three nights a week, and Nick worked with Josh one or two nights a week. Dixie was really nice and fun to be around, but she didn't particularly like the job or want to be there. Josh would get annoyed with her a lot for just standing behind the register while he did most of the work. But again, it was only one night a week, so he didn't complain too much. Nick, on the other hand, was a bit different. He worked there five days a week, just like Josh and I, but they never seemed to put him with one person more than one day a week. Nobody seemed to really like him or like working with him. Nick was definitely a little off from the start. He was one of those people who told you his entire life story as soon as he met you, giving a bunch of really personal details that no one was really comfortable hearing. One thing that he always seemed to talk about was the strain on his marriage. Apparently, he had a really bad drinking and drug problem for a very long time. The drug part got better when he switched over to weed, but he still couldn't seem to get his drinking under control. He was hard to be around, but he was just one of those guys you get kind of used to in that kind of job. I was there for almost three months when Nick's story seemed to escalate out of complete nowhere. He began telling people that when he was younger, he was diagnosed as a psychopath. He had to take a bunch of pills for it every day so he wouldn't become violent. Not exactly what you want to hear from someone you're working alone with in the middle of the night, but okay. We all have our own problems, right? And some people get dealt a bad hand when it comes to mental illness. I myself have always struggled to get my anxiety and depression under control without medication. I wouldn't be killing people by any means, but I'd probably be hospitalized in the category of danger to self. So as creepy as that was, I assured him that a lot of people need to take medicine for some kind of illness. And as long as you stick to it and are honest with the medical professionals, there's no reason you still can't do anything anyone else can do. He seemed pleased with this answer. And soon after that, the subject was turned to other things. He was especially cheery and nice to me after that for the next week or so, letting me know daily that he was taking his medicine, and it felt like things were going well with him. I always answered enthusiastically, but I'm pretty sure everyone, especially Josh, was aware of how much I wish he would stop talking to me, and would just kind of leave me alone about it. Josh had a wife and daughter who was two, so, he couldn't help but see us younger girls through the eyes of what his daughter might potentially have to deal with when she reached our age, and seemed to go out of his way to end conversations with Nick rather quickly, which I was grateful for, and didn't really try to pretend that I liked Nick. It wasn't long before Nick started conversations with me going into details about why he was diagnosed, instead of how his medicine was working, which I won't get into here because a lot of it was very violent and sexual. I told him repeatedly that I didn't want to know about that, to which he would act like he understood and then change the subject, only for him to circle back to it an hour or so later. When I confided to Dixie about it, she told me that she would take care of it and told her friend, which was the manager I told you about earlier. Come to find out the manager couldn't really do much, and it seemed I was the only one that he would talk to about these things. 
But the manager told me to come to her again if he ever made me feel uncomfortable. It was starting to get increasingly tense for everyone working with him. Soon enough, two other women who worked with him on the night shift reported comments that he made to them, to the manager as well. I was questioned, which I agreed that all the statements made up by those women were similar to things that he'd said to me. Nick was then given a final warning and a write-up. On the next couple of times that I saw him, he would go on these rants about how people were there, only reporting him because they didn't like him. I assume he didn't know that I'd been one of those people, and neither I nor Josh had any intention to tell him. He got so angry at one point that he was practically in tears, saying how they're lucky that he was on meds and what he would do to them if he wasn't. Luckily, it was at that point that his shift ended, and he clocked out soon after. Josh told him that we had a lot of work to get done that night, so we didn't really have time to chat with him. He nodded, walked out the door without another word. Josh really wasn't lying either. The truck had come extremely late that day, so there was still quite a bit of things that needed to be put on the shelf. One thing that the earlier shifts never seemed to want to do, unless they absolutely had to, was stocking the drink coolers. It was true that it was easier to do at night when there were less customers, so it was annoying since we couldn't really talk, but we all just went with it. I can't remember that time that Josh went into the drink cooler, but it must have been pretty late since we'd all been there for a while at that point. I was still focused on stocking the shelves and making sure that everything looked full if we didn't have it, when the bell chimed, signaling that someone had come in. I threw out a good evening, I'd be right with you. Usually, there wasn't anyone coming in that late, and if they did, they only wanted a pack of cigarettes or to pay for gas. I put down my box and went to the register. And there he was. It was Nick. And not looking at me, but leaning next to my register. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't afraid. It did turn out that he was just drunk, but I couldn't detect it exactly right away. Even so, I considered for about 30 seconds if I should actually go or if I should run to the cooler and get Josh. Nick wasn't a young fit guy or anything. Years of drugs and drinking had aged him prematurely and ruined his body, but he was definitely still intimidating to a 20-year-old girl. Unfortunately, Nick made the decision for me when he was probably tired of waiting, I guess, turned to me, and that's when I noticed immediately that there was something way off about him. My voice was nothing more than a pathetic whimper when I asked him what he wanted. He just stared at me. I was about to speak again, but he spoke first, barely intelligible because of his slurring. He leave you here alone? It took me a second to shake my head and tell him again in a steady voice that Josh was in the cooler. I asked if he wanted me to go get him. Again, he just stared at me in silence. At this point, I didn't even care what he said. I just wanted him to say something. The silent staring was really creeping me out. So I asked again, with more force in my voice. What do you want, Nick? As soon as I stopped speaking, he grinned at me in a disgusting, almost singing voice. He said, You're lying. You are alone. He laughed and tried to take a step forward, but stumbled allowing me to take several steps backwards. At this point, I should have just run to Josh. I should have called for him, anything. But I just couldn't believe that I was reading the situation right, and it was playing right out before me in front of my eyes. Nick was really weird, but I'd never felt actual danger around him before. He'd come off as more a little unstable, if anything else. He continued forward in a slow, stumbling steps, telling me to... Come here. I... I just want to talk. I kept out of reach, telling him to back up, and that I would hurt him if I had to. He thought that was particularly amusing, and laughed loudly enough that it caused Josh to look through the spaces between the drinks to find out what was going on. Josh was out the door in a second. He seemed to come out of nowhere, shoving himself between Nick and I. No words were spoken. They just stared at each other. And then Josh finally said in a stern tone, I think you should leave, now. Nick stared blankly for a moment, then scoffed, telling us that we couldn't take a joke. I was trying not to cry at this point. The only thing more terrifying about the situation was knowing that if Josh hadn't been there and he had somehow caught me, I would have stood no chance against him. Josh left me standing with my back against the wall, corralling Nick to the door. Completely unexpected on both of our parts, Nick turned and took a swing at Josh. And luckily, because he was just drunk or really uncoordinated, he missed Josh's face, 
Josh grabbed the back of his coat and brought him down as he smashed his knee into Nick's stomach or chest area. I'm not really sure which. He missed the opportunity of his sputtering to drag him up to the door and throwing him out, locking it. Josh had just turned and told me to call the cops as we heard this sickening crack behind him. We both jumped and looked at the door. There was now this big circle around the glass. It's kind of hard to explain, but if you've ever seen a movie of one or an actual car wreck when something hits a windshield but it's not hard enough to break through and it turns all white from the point of impact, that's what it looked like. Josh didn't have to tell me what to do this time. I ran to the register, grabbed the phone, and went to the corner furthest away from the front door and huddled on the floor. I didn't even notice at the time, but Josh had told me later that when he turned to see the glass, that was the first time that he noticed that Nick had a hunting knife in his other hand. The fact that he tried to punch Josh instead of stab him is a mystery and a miracle. I was sobbing when the operator picked up the phone. I don't even know how she understood me. I was crying so hard, but between my distress and the sounds of Josh and Nick yelling at each other in the background, she got the urgency of the situation. She then asked me where I was. I got up to find a receipt to see what the actual address was, and then the glass smashed. I dropped back to the floor, and she told me the officers were already on their way and to do whatever I could to get away or hide, even if I had to leave Josh behind. The hole wasn't big enough for him to get through, but he had made it. He'd thrown an ashtray from outside, through the window, from that hole. He could reach the lock on the door. According to Josh, he walked to the door and put his mouth against the hole that he'd just formed and said something that I'm, I'm sobbing right now even thinking about. In that horrible, sing-song voice that he used the first time I talked to him that night, he said, They're never gonna find you two. Needless to say, as tough as Josh was acting, he was shitting bricks just as much as I was. He was older than Nick, in his mid-thirties, but he was a beanpole and wasn't exactly known for his fighting skills. Even so, as soon as Nick unlocked and started to open the door, Josh slammed his body into it, knocking Nick backwards from the impact. Josh yelled for me to run. Even though my legs felt like they would give out at any moment, I ran right behind him to the receiving doors into the back of the store. Nick was cursing and yelling at us as the door jingle went off. Josh slammed back into the back door, cursing in pain as he realized the back door wouldn't open. We found out later that Nick had pushed the dumpster in front of the door, locking the wheels before he came in. We seemed to both realize at once that he actually planned this out. He actually did plan to kill us. Nick rounded the corner, still doing that awkward stumbling walk, though it was faster now. It at least gave me time to slam the back door shut and lock it. As I was sitting in front of it, Josh bringing anything over to try to barricade the door. He must have heard me crying because he kept calling out my name. Telling me that I wasn't the one who he wanted. And he would make sure that I died before I even felt the pain. If I would just open up the door for him. He then started stabbing the door and screaming at me to open it. I screamed and moved when he stabbed it the first time. But Josh and I both moved immediately to hold it shut again. I remember Josh and I making eye contact. We were both crying now. And I wanted so badly to say something to comfort him. But I couldn't think of anything to say. I dropped my phone when we ran to hold the door shut. And neither of us could move to go get it. So we had no idea how long until the police would get there. And this door was made out of wood. So it's not going to last that long against his body slams and offered little to no protection if his knife actually went through. All I could think was, I'm gonna die here. My dog would never know why I didn't come home. That I wouldn't get my degree and have enough money to actually start enjoying life. That all the plans my girlfriend and I had for the future would never happen. In the most anticlimactic and wonderful finish ever, it suddenly went silent. There were no police car alarms, no yelling, nothing. It was as if Nick had just vanished. Josh and I looked at each other, not even daring to breathe, and listening for any sign of life on the other side of the door. We both slammed to the ground when a gunshot went off once, then twice, then a third time. There was more silence, then a voice rang out, asking if anyone was here. At first we weren't sure if we should say anything, then a voice continued with his name that he was an off-duty EMT who had been listening to the scanner. 
Josh then got up and pushed the things aside in front of the door, opening it just enough to put his head out, and then it seemed like all the breath just left him. He opened up the door and went out into the store, relief completely all over him. I ran and grabbed my phone, seeing that the call had disconnected from the dispatcher or maybe she had hung up. When I went out into the store where Josh was, and our rescuer was, he was in the middle of explaining how the police over the scanner were sending a bunch of cars, but they were all still really far away, and he had a horrible feeling that they wouldn't get there in time when the dispatcher was telling him what they'd find when we got there. He didn't want either of us to go outside until the police got here because Nick had been shot in the shoulder. He still had the knife when he took off. EMT said he would have ran after him, but with the state that the store was in, he was scared that someone was in here dying or hurt. The next 20 minutes were a blur. Josh and I were sitting on the floor hugging each other. The EMT had called dispatch and told them the new situation, and most of the cars that were coming to our location were diverted to looking for Nick. It was soon after that that Josh got to use his phone to call his wife, and she came right over, only bringing their daughter because he begged her to. He seemed to completely break down when he held his daughter and hugged his wife. I had an extremely similar reaction when I finally got to go home and came in to see my dog's body wiggling excitedly, proudly displaying his flamingo toy for me to have as a welcome home gift. Nick was found two weeks later in an old RV in the woods that he'd been using to do his drinking and drugs in so his wife wouldn't catch him. Apparently, the reason that he'd come after us was because he thought that the reason Josh wanted him to leave so quickly was so that he could call the owner again and this time, the complaint would get him fired. Unknown to us, his wife had kicked him out four days before this happened and was in the process of getting a restraining order against him over threatening texts and phone calls she had been getting from him. He stated that his job was all he had left and Josh needed to be punished for trying to take that away from him. He said that I wasn't the target and he didn't want to have to kill me, but he knew that he had a much better chance of killing Josh with me there than Dixie since Josh would be more likely to face him to protect me. Neither Josh or I called the owner or even a manager over his comments that night, though maybe we should have. It was disturbing what he was saying, and in hindsight, we were so used to being him a creep and saying horrible things that it didn't even register to us that he could be serious about trying to actually hurt someone. I had known him for three months, and Josh had known him for like six, and he had never done anything violent towards anyone. Everyone just thought he was all talk. We also put in faith in the fact that every employee had a background check on them before they were hired. So it's not like Nick had been violent before. Nick took a plea deal so that the two counts of attempted murder would be dropped, and he would instead go to a mental hospital for offenders. The reason I'm writing this story now, other than the other stories on the stub inspiring me, is that I received a phone call just two weeks ago, notifying me that as long as there's no setbacks to his health status, Nick is set to be released June 8th of this year. When I called Josh, he had said he received the same news the day before. Neither Josh or I work there anymore, and Josh has since moved away to another town on the other side of the city. I have switched to going college completely online and I'm in a new place that I'm renting with a roommate. I don't think he'll come after either of us. I don't see how he could blame us for what happened. I read so many of these stories and after the fact everyone seems to be prepared for what they have to do if ever they see the person again that they're writing about. I don't think I'd be any more prepared to face him this time than I was back then. I've had pretty intense nightmares every day since, but ever since I got the call, every time I close my eyes. All I can hear is that one sentence louder and clearer. They're never gonna find you to... Nick, if it was true that you were diagnosed as a psychopath, I hope you're getting the help you need. You've already destroyed my peace of mind, and even now, years later, I don't feel safe, especially at night. I don't believe in God, but I pray to anyone that's listening to me that we never meet again. When I was 13, the dawning of the new millennium took place on New Year's Eve, while people were fearing for the worst with the Y2K bug, or out partying and drinking, I was home alone. In 1996, my parents had split up, and from there they divorced. 
My mother and I moved across the country from Oregon to Tennessee with her best friend. On the eve of the year 2000, I was home alone and my mother was currently out of state. Now, this didn't worry me as it was not my first time. I often came home to find a note on the kitchen counter saying they'd gone to Florida for a few days and that there were groceries in the fridge. Since the divorce, she was regularly leaving me alone for long periods of time to go to Florida. We lived on a relatively quiet road surrounded by trees and set a few miles outside of town. And I knew most of the people, if not by name, then by face enough to wave and make small chat with. And never before had been given a reason to be afraid of being all by myself. On the night in question, I was staying up late watching television and had most of the lights on in the house. Not because I was afraid, but because at 13, I wasn't concerned with electricity bills or saving the environment. I felt completely safe and protected within my bubble of a home. As I was watching the movie, I kept hearing these weird sounds outside, but I remember thinking it was probably the neighbors. Though they weren't extremely close, a couple of them were having a party or people over for the holiday. About halfway into the movie, however, the power in the house suddenly went out. I sat on the couch for a minute, just sort of in a panic daze because it was near midnight and now pitch black. I remember thinking the power must have gone out and that it would come back on, so I decided to sit on the couch with my blanket and just wait. A few minutes passed by when I heard a noise in the kitchen where the back door is. My heart started racing in my chest because I thought it sounded like the back door being shut. The back door sits just off the dining room, which is connected to the kitchen, which leads directly into the living room where I was currently sitting on the couch. A few seconds passed after I heard that sound, and I was straining my ears to pick up anything that wasn't supposed to be there. Every noise suddenly felt magnified. When footsteps sounded on the floor, I immediately slithered off the couch onto all fours, crawled around the ottoman, and started as slowly and as quietly as I could to make my way toward the space between the love seat and the couch. I knew I could fit under the side table and be completely hidden by the dark and the ottoman from playing hide and go seek in the dark many, many times with my friends during sleepovers. I was nearly there when the footsteps became more apparent. I knew from the sound of them that whoever it was was making their way through the kitchen now toward the living room. They weren't hurried or anything, it was like they were just moving around in the kitchen. I glanced up from where I was crouched on the floor, and to my horror, there was a dark silhouette standing in the archway between the two rooms. To my credit, I didn't scream. However, I did panic. I stood immediately to my feet from a hiding spot and ran down the hallway. And I believe the only reason I wasn't overcome was because the person chasing me had to get around the ottoman in the dark to follow me. I did what all children do when they're afraid and I bypassed the front door, the guest bedroom, the bathroom and ran to the furthest door down the hallway my room. In all honesty, I probably wouldn't have been able to get to the front door and unlock it in time, as it was right off the side of the couch. When I was 10, I got a bird for my birthday. He was a blue fronted Amazon and I named him Boo, because it was October and so close to Halloween. Boo had a large iron cage, and it felt like it was like 6 feet tall, and it was kept in my room, despite the fact that Boo, like me, pretty much had the run of the house wherever he wanted. This information will become relevant later on in the story. As I ran into the room, I slammed the door shut and locked it. However, the lock was simply one of those little turn knobs that you can easily pop with a butter knife. I had barely gotten the door shut and locked it when the person on the other side knocked on it. I have no idea why they knocked. If they did it to mock me or scare me. But I knew in my heart that my little lock was not going to keep whoever it was on the other side out of my room. It didn't keep my mother out when we were arguing, and it wouldn't stand up to brute force. I was panicking and on the verge of tears when the person started laughing. He was low, quiet, and because of that, it was even more frightening. It wasn't like manic laughter, but as if they were genuinely amused. It was the laughter that really frightened me. I started heavily hysterically crying and looking around my room to figure out what I could do. That was when I realized Boo's cage would almost fit perfectly between the door and the wall of my closet. The cage moved quietly on my carpeted floor, 
but as I pushed it into place, it scraped against the door and alerted whoever it was on the other side that I was trying to barricade myself in. Because suddenly, they threw themselves at the door, and you could hear the sound of the wood splintering and the door handle being twisted violently. Boo, who had been stirred by the movement, began literally screaming and flapping his wings. I might have screamed with him, but honestly, I don't remember screaming. I just remember being extremely scared, terrified. I crawled under my bed and waited. Several minutes passed, and the person eventually stopped attacking my door. Boo continued screaming even after he had stopped. Though being under my bed gave me no feelings of being secure. I didn't come out from under it because I simply had nowhere else to go. I thought about trying to go out the window, but I felt and I was afraid he might expect that and therefore be waiting for me on the other side. It was also several feet off the ground as the house was built on a raised foundation. I remember laying underneath my bed, terrified for what felt like hours. I must have fallen asleep because I woke the next morning to daylight. The fear of what happened came back to me as soon as I registered where I was and why. Scared that whoever had been in my house that night might still be there. I decided to crawl out the window and run to a neighbor's since it was daylight outside now. And therefore, I felt less afraid. Crawling out of a window is a lot harder than it looks, and I did it less than gracefully, as I was not, and still am not, the most coordinated human being. Once I was back on my feet, however, carefully made my way around the house, and that's when I noticed that the back door was wide open. Scared, but feeling braver now that I was outside and it was morning, instead of a pitch black night, I walked up the back steps and peered inside, seeing nothing out of the ordinary. I decided to go back in. Looking back, I cringe on how stupid this could have turned out, and that I wish I could tell my younger self to make the smarter move and just go get help. But thankfully, no one was inside the house. I did a terrifying, heart-pounding room-to-room check, looking in closets and under beds, behind the couch, anywhere I thought even a small child might even be able to fit. I even popped the lock off my mom's bedroom so I could check, and then relocked it afterwards. When I was positive there was no one there, I went back to lock the back door. I noticed that the breaker box on the opposite wall was open. The main switch had been pulled. I flipped it back on, locked both locks on the back door, checked all the windows and front door, and then called my mom. Where I once again broke down crying hysterically. She called a coworker who came and stayed the entire day with me as they drove back. My mom still took random trips to Florida after that, but I always went with her from then on forward. So, terrifying, laughing, crazy person that broke into my house on New Year's Eve, please, let's never meet again. I sincerely hope no other young girl had to meet you either. I don't know if you were just some drunk visitor of a neighbor, but you terrorized me that night. I was afraid of being alone when my mom was working, and still to this day, I get scared when I'm home alone, and overthink what I would do if someone came inside, and where I would hide. When my cats make noise out of nowhere, I immediately investigate for fear it's someone trying to get in. This night started in the city but ended up deep in the woods. I wanted to put that out there not to break any rules of this sub. This is true and I will obscure the locations for personal safety and I apologize for the length. I'm originally from the northeast but I couldn't stand the winters so I went south for college. I was enrolled in my first year of university in the southern part of the US. The university was in a small city town and going out to drink was the main thing that everyone did. I was out with some other guys, playing pool at a small dive bar. An older guy came up and started talking to us, asked if he could get in on the game. I'll refer to him as Brian. I was 22 then, and he looked a bit older, probably in his late 30s. We played a few games, and he commented about a bonfire party happening just outside of town. He mentioned that there were some girls he worked with hosting it, and asked if we wanted to go. My friends declined, but I was single, so I said sure. As we left the parking lot in his truck, 
He said he needed to swing by his apartment and grab some liquor. This is when things got a little weird. I remember getting in the car and pulling out of the parking lot and then pulling up into an apartment complex on the outskirts of town. The bar was in the downtown area. and We were far away now on the outskirts. I wondered if I nodded off on the ride because I don't even remember the drive. I started questioning myself when he said that he would go inside, get the booze, take a shower, and then change his clothes. He offered for me to come inside too. The inside of his apartment was empty. No furniture, nothing was hanging on the walls, just open and empty rooms. He didn't say anything about it, so I asked if he had just moved in. He said yeah, and then walked back to the bathroom without saying anything else. I thought about just leaving when I heard him get in the shower. Something about the situation was just starting to creep me out. I was sizing him up in my head, thought I could take him if some weird shit went down. I remember him mentioning the girls in the bonfire, so I decided to hang around and see where the night went. The shower stopped, he walked out wearing different clothes a few minutes later. He had two bottles of whiskey, and he looked at me and said, Ready? We jumped back in his truck and pulled out. I made a conscious effort to stay awake and alert. We left the city limits and headed outside of town on a dark back road. We were still on a main road, but we're far from town now, and the closest city that I knew of was an hour away in the opposite direction. There were fewer and fewer houses as we drove. The places I could see looked like decrepit old shacks. I had lived here for a couple of months, but I've never been out this way. We continued to drive for a while, and I asked a few times if he knew where he was going. This was the middle of nowhere now. I didn't see any houses, and it was just thick woods on each side of the road. I didn't see him reading off any directions or anything. I saw a small parking lot with a gas station and a turnoff. A lone street light lit the gas station. Two pumps, and they both looked ancient. And a red neon sign saying 24 hours. The building was a double wide trailer converted into a store. We turned off onto the side street and kept going. This road was even worse than the main road we were just on. There were no street lights and it was very narrow. It twisted and turned, snaking through the woods. Still no houses visible, but I would see an old mailbox every once in a while. We came to the top of the hill and there was a driveway. I asked again if he knew where he was going and he just chuckled. I was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods with some dude I didn't know. Fear did start to creep in. It wasn't at a house, it was more like a garage or industrial building. There were no lights inside or around it, and no motion lights as we drove up. No other cars or people. Where's the bonfire? I made my tone sound direct as possible. He just said, back through the woods. We drove past the building, around the back, toward the woods. As we got closer, I could see a small path, and as we went through, branches scraped alongside the truck. After what seemed like forever, the trail opened up into a clearing. I could see a few other trucks and people. Relief washed over me. I grew up in a city and wasn't used to shit like this. I started to think I was just being uptight and I needed to chill out. It was past midnight and we left the bar around 10, so it felt good to finally get out of the truck. I scanned the group of people, but could only see a few girls. A couple of guys were building a fire trying to get it going. There were maybe 25 to 30 people there. A guy who was introduced as Mike walked up to us and to greet Brian, but he was staring at me the whole time. He never once stopped staring at me. Brian said he needed to take a piss and walked off. And Mike asked if I wanted a beer. He said to hang tight and walked away. Came back moments later and handed me an open bottle. I said thanks and started to make small talk, but he just turned and walked away. I started to look around and something just seemed off. There was no music playing, no lights, no liveliness to the conversation. The people at this party seemed diverse in age. I was wondering how they even knew each other because no one was talking. They were all just standing together in small groups and mumbling. Each time I approached a group of people, they would all stop talking and just stare at me. It was very standoffish and extremely uncomfortable. I just found myself standing alone and looking around for Brian. Couldn't see him anywhere. I looked around his truck but didn't see. By this time, I've had enough of this weird shit and was ready to go. I kept scanning around looking for his truck but it wasn't there. 
I didn't hear any vehicle start up or come and go while I was walking around. I turned back towards the bonfire and saw everyone was now looking at me together. All 30 or so people were now in one grouping, and they just stood there. No talking or movement. They were just standing completely still and staring at me. The bonfire glowed behind the group, making the moment feel very surreal. I stood there awkwardly and started noticing that their faces were changing. Their expressions rapidly changed from smiling to frowning. Eyes wide to snarling grimaces. But as I focused on one of them to see if that was what was really happening, the face would appear blank and expressionless. Suddenly, one of the men started walking toward me with a deliberate pace, and I turned and just ran. I ran up the path out of the clearing as fast as I could. My adrenaline was surging, and I kept running. I couldn't hear anyone coming up behind me or any vehicles, but I knew I could not stop and needed to put as much distance as possible between them and me. I started to panic as the trail broke off and went different ways. didn't remember that from driving in. I just kept running. Finally, I saw the building through the trees and felt some sort of relief. I stopped just before the edge of the trail. It was late fall and brisk, but I was burning up. I was wearing a flannel and jeans with boots. Not very good for running. I was sweating like a pig and I needed to catch my breath. I couldn't hear anyone coming up behind me on the path or still hear any vehicles in the distance. And the light from the bonfire wasn't visible anymore through the thick woods. As I crossed the lot and passed the industrial building toward the paved road, the lights came on inside. A second wind of adrenaline took hold and I ran towards the paved road and just kept running. My feet felt like lead and my legs burned but I kept running as long as I possibly could. Finally got tired and moved off the paved road into the bush to hide and catch my breath. I didn't see any headlights still. So I went back to the side of the road and began jogging. I was on high alert and kept glancing behind me but never saw anything. I reached the end of the road, which connected back to the main road and that gas station. I went inside, and an old guy sat at the counter watching a small TV, and he asked if I was alright. I told him I needed to use the phone. He laughed and said, where'd you come from? I was out at a party and got ditched. He laughed a little and then gestured toward the phone on the wall. I could see he had a gun on his hip and probably thought I was a tweaker come to rob him. There was a phone book by the phone. I called a taxi to come pick me up. An hour later, I was back in my dorm and went to sleep. I never saw Brian again. I drove past his apartment complex but never saw his truck parked there. I never saw it around town or back at that same bar either. I'll never forget it. It was an off-white single cab Chevy. A late 80s model with a skull sticker on the back window with Roman numerals on the forehead. My curiosity got the best of me a few times. I drove toward the small gas station, followed the road to where the shop was and found it. I drove out there a couple of times, and each time there was no one there, and no cars in the lot. The building looked even shittier in the daytime. I left and drove back to town. This happened in the fall of 2004. I still get creeped out by it. The Blue Hole is a 100 meter deep sinkhole on the coast of the Red Sea, five miles north of Dahab, Egypt. Its nickname is the Diver Cemetery. Divers in that area have claimed that 200 have died in recent years. Many of those who died were attempting to swim under the arch. Many certified scuba divers think that they're capable of just going a little deeper. But they don't know that there are special gas mixtures, buoyancy equipment, and training required for just a few meters of depth. Imagine this. You take your PADI open water diving course and you learn your dive charts. You buy your own gear and become familiar with it. Compared to the average person on the street, you're an expert now. You go diving on coral reefs, a few shipwrecks, and even catch lobster in New England. You go to visit a deep spot like this and you're having a great time. You see something just in front of you. This beautiful cave with sunlight streaming through. You decide to swim just a little closer. You're not going to go inside it. You know better than that. But you just want to take a closer look. If your dive computer starts beeping, 
You'll head back up. You swim a little closer. It's breathtaking. You're enjoying the view, just floating there, taking it all in. You hear a clanging sound. It's your dive master, wrapping the butt of his knife on his tank to get someone's attention. You look up to see what he wants. But after staring into darkness for the last minute, the sunlight streaming down is blinding you. You turn away to reach to check your dive computer. It's a little awkward for some reason, and you twist your shoulder and pull it towards you. It's beeping, and the screen is flashing, go up. You stare at it for a few seconds, trying to make out the depth and the tank level between the flashing words. The numbers won't stay still. It's really annoying, and your brain isn't getting the info you want at a glance. So you let it fall back to your left shoulder, turn towards the light, and head up. The problem is, the blue hole is bigger than anything you've ever dove before, and the crystal clear water provides a visibility that is ten times what you're used to in the dark waters of St. Louis, where you usually dive. What you don't realize is that when you swam down a little further just to get a closer look, thinking it was only 30 or 40 feet more, you actually swam almost twice that because the vast scale of things have been messed up in your sense of distance. And while you were looking at the archway, you didn't have any nearby point of reference in your vision. More depth equals more pressure. And your BCD, the air-filled jacket that you used to control your buoyancy, was compressed a little. You were slowly sinking and had no idea. That's when the dive master began banging his tank when you looked up. This only served to blind you for a moment and distract your sense of motion and position even more. Your dive computer wasn't sticking out on your chest just below your shoulder when you reached for it, because your BCD was shrinking. You turned your body sideways while twisting and reaching for it. The 10 seconds spent fumbling for it and staring at the screen brought you deeper and you began to accelerate with your jacket continuing to shrink. The reason that you didn't hear the beeping at first and that it took so long to make out the depth between the flashing words was the nitrogen narcosis. You've been getting depth drunk, and the numbers wouldn't stay still because you were still sinking. You swam towards the light, but the current is pulling you sideways. Your brain is hurting, straining for no reason. And the blue hole seems like it's gotten narrower, and the light rays above you are going at a funny angle. You kick harder just to keep going up toward the light. Despite this damn current that wants to push you into the wall, your computer is beeping incessantly, and it feels like you're swimming through mud. Fuck this. You grab the fill button on your jacket and squeeze it. You're not supposed to use your jacket to ascend. As you know, that will expand as the pressure drops, and you will need to carefully bleed off air to avoid shooting up to the surface. But you don't care about that anymore. Shooting up to the surface is exactly what you want right now and you'll deal with bleeding air off and making depth stops when you're back up with the rest of the group. The sound of air rushing into your BCD fills your ears, but nothing's happening. Something doesn't sound right, like the air isn't filling fast enough. You look down at your jacket, searching for whatever the trouble might be when thunk, you bump right into the side of a giant sinkhole. What the hell? Why is the current pulling me sideways? Why is there even a current in an empty hole in the middle of the ocean? You keep holding the button. Inflate, damn it, inflate! Your computer is now making a frantically screeching sound that you've never heard before. You notice that you've been breathing heavily. It's a sign of stress. The sound of air rushing into your jacket is getting weaker. Every 10 meters of water adds one atmosphere of pressure. Your tank has enough air for you to spend an hour at 10 meters, and to refill your BCD more than 100 times. Each additional 20 meters of depth cuts this time in half. This assumes that you are calm, controlling your breathing, and using your muscles slowly with intention. If you panic, begin breathing quickly and more rapidly. This cuts your time in half. You're certified to 20 meters, and you've gone briefly down to 30 meters on some shipwrecks before so you were comfortable swimming to 25 meters to look at the arch. While you were looking at it, you sank to 40 meters. And while you messed up looking around at your dive master and then the computer, you sank to 60 meters. 
at six atmospheres of pressure. You only have ten minutes of air at this depth. When you swam for the surface, you'd become disoriented from twisting around. And then looking at your gear, you were now right in front of the archway. You swam into the archway, thinking it was the surface. That's why the blue hole looks smaller now. There is no current pulling you sideways. You are continuing to sink to the bottom of the arch. When you hit the bottom and started to inflate your BCD, you are now over 90 meters. You will go through a full tank of air in only a couple of minutes at this depth. Panicking like this, you're down to seconds. There's only enough air to inflate your BCD, but it will take over a minute to fill. And it doesn't matter, because that would only pull you up into the top of the arch, and you will drown before you get there. Holding the inflate button as you kick as hard as you can for the light. Your muscles are screaming. Your brain is screaming. It's getting harder and harder to suck each panic breath out of your regulator. A final fit of rage and frustration. You scream into your useless reg. Darkness squeezing into every corner of your vision. Four minutes. That's how long your dive lasted. You died in clear water on a sunny day in only four minutes. People laugh at me when I tell them this story, but to me, it was extremely scary and sad. This happened in January 2018. I was still living in beautiful Hawaii with my infant daughter and my husband. We woke up from the sun shining on us through the window, and we were talking about going to the beach. We were all three of us just laying in bed, looking at our phones. I remember searching on Yelp for the best Akai Bowl to get in Hawaii. And then all of a sudden my phone vibrated and I received a government alert. Emergency alert. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. That's the exact message I received and froze. My husband, who was a tough infantry soldier, just went, What the and looked at me. I'm not sure how my face looked, but I was terrified. I had read threats about North Korea for a couple of months now, so I wasn't completely surprised. I just couldn't believe that this was actually happening. At the time of this, we were living in military housing. Wheeler, which is right next to Schofield Barracks. I know Wheeler got hit the day Pearl Harbor was attacked, and it was being next to the army base solidified the fact to me that whoever sent the missile would obviously aim for us. Clearly, I did and still do not know much about missiles and bombs and how they're sent off. But all I could think was that my little baby and our dog and I were about to die. My husband instructed me to hide in the bathroom, so I grabbed water bottles, my baby, and our sweet dog, put a blanket in the bathtub, and sat down holding the baby and hugging our dog. I was shaking and crying and managed to send a few messages out. I whatsapped my mom, who lives in Europe, and my dad, who lives in Guam, told them I loved them and that I'm going to die. I felt so horrible because my older brother passed away, and I could not imagine putting them through that pain once again. As many mothers would do, mine immediately called and started crying. My husband, who is normally a huge talker, was actually quiet, and sent his goodbye messages to people. Time stood still, and I just kept praying and promising that if I were to survive this, I would become a better person. I had been dealing with horrible postpartum depression, which made me question my right to live. But those 20 minutes really made me realize how quickly everything could be gone and over. After what seemed like forever, we received another alert. I have never felt so much relief in my life than when that message came in, and this whole alert was an accident. We were told later that a government employee fell asleep and fell on a button that sent out alerts. I still don't buy it, but I don't care. All I care about is that my family and I are alive. I'm not sure why I remember this day so well, but it turned out to be a beautiful day. Obviously, the whole island was talking about this, and it created a bunch of chaos. I feel like everyone was nicer than usual. I went for a long walk with my baby and dog, and appreciated my life, the sun, the gorgeous scenery, and even my struggles. Later on, we went to the beach with some family and had a beautiful rest of the day.
This is a story I heard from a guy who used to be our driver back in the day. I can't vouch for its authenticity, as I wasn't there, but it's one hell of a story nonetheless. So this guy, Lakba, was returning to Darjeeling after dropping a passenger to Siliguri. Though the total distance is only 70 kilometers, the journey usually would take 3-4 to four hours due to the majority of the road being in hilly terrain. Let me give you a brief explanation of the route. There are many smaller towns that fall between Siliguri and Darjeeling, with the largest one being Kyrsong. Kyrsong is situated approximately halfway between Siliguri and Darjeeling. If you want to travel from Siliguri to Darjeeling or vice versa, you have to go through Kyrsong, unless you want to take a longer route. There are three roads connecting these three, PB Road, the Hillcart Road, and the Rohini Road. This incident happened in the 1980s, so the Rohini Road hadn't been constructed yet. The PB Road, which is very isolated to this date, wasn't considered safe at the time, especially after dark. So he was on Hillcart Road. After driving for around 40 minutes, he reached a small town called Tinharia. This was around 10.30 p.m. He noticed an average looking young woman in casual clothes, standing alone on the side of the road. She appeared to be hitchhiking, so he offered her a ride. She thanked him and sat shotgun. She told him that she lived with her parents and brother in a small town somewhere between Kyrsong and Darjeeling, and had been invited to a birthday party of one of her friends living in Tenharia. She had lost track of time during the celebration, and by the time she decided to leave, the last taxi for the day had already left. Her friends had asked to spend the night and just leave in the morning, but she declined their offer, explaining that her parents would be upset if she stayed. The story seemed innocent enough, so Lakpa wasn't in the least suspicious. They chatted happily and soon reached Kursong around 11 p.m. Drivers generally halt at Kursong for refreshments and a bit of rest, but that day, Lakpa was forced to drive on as all the shops had already shut, owning to the lateness of the hour. The journey continued, and they finally reached the woman's destination at around midnight. The woman pointed at a plain-looking two-storied house with the front lawn standing independently on the edge of town. He also didn't find this suspicious, as it's not uncommon to see such houses in this area. She thanked him and offered to pay for the ride, but he declined and was about to leave when the woman asked if he would like to spend the night at her house. As he was pretty exhausted from all the driving, he was tempted to take her offer, but he was hesitant as he thought he would be imposing. However, on her insistence, he finally agreed. After parking his car on the side of the road, he followed her into the house. The main door was unlocked, and she explained that her parents had left it open for her. As she let him in, she told him to be quiet so her family wouldn't be disturbed. She soon took him to a room on the ground floor and showed him the accommodations. There was no bed, but a mattress was rolled up in the corner. After helping him roll out the mattress and providing pillows, blankets, and covers, she pointed at a hook on the wall, where he would be able to hang his clothes. She then bid him good night and left for her own room, which was on the first floor. Lakpa, after hanging his jacket on the hook, drifted off as soon as his head hit the pillows, as he was completely exhausted. The next morning, he sensed a bright light even before his eyes opened, and he could feel a chilly breeze that made him shiver. As he opened his eyes, he was astonished to see that he was lying under open sky, on the ground, in the middle of a meadow of sorts. He felt confused and disoriented before he recalled what had transpired the night before. As he got up in bewilderment, he noticed that he was laying in the middle of a graveyard. And to his horror, he realized that he'd been sleeping on someone's grave, with his jacket hanging off the tombstone. He bolted towards his car, which was parked near the graveyard, started the engine, and drove away as fast as he could. I guess this isn't as scary as some of the other stories that involve the supernatural, but I was about 24 and living in Seattle. My roommate was away, and her friend Amy invited me out for a drink. My boyfriend didn't feel like going, so it was just us. I made sure to tell her it's just a drink or two, since I knew she was a bit wild. And I really wasn't that close to her, but I was new to the area and needed friends, so I took $20 with me, 
No ATM card, no nothing. I wanted an excuse in case she wanted to stay out too late. Previously, I had gone with her and my roommate to a bar where she knew the owner and the bartenders. It was a total dive bar and kind of sketchy. On this, my roommate and I agreed. We're talking leather vests and bare chest. No offense, just a tough crowd and way older. She asked us to go back there a few times, but we always said nah, because the place was just sketchy and the owner was skeevy. And that's putting it mildly. Let's call him Lou. And the bar? Lou's. So we go out, and this already sounds like a terrible idea already. Though she was wild, she was good people, and I still abide by that. Again, just a drink or two. We went up to Capitol Hill, which has a lot of fun bars and is a very nice and safe area. I bought us our first two beers, $4, and tipped the bartender a dollar. At 15 left. When I come back with the drinks, she's talking to two preppy looking clean cut guys about some outdoor concert venue that's apparently fabulous. She introduces me. I'm asking questions about the place and yada yada, talking music. Next morning I wake up in my underpants in my roommate's bed, next to Amy, who is still completely dressed. What the? I'm so confused and embarrassed because good lord, we are hardly close enough that I dress in front of her let alone sleep half naked in a bed with her. I kind of just ask what the heck happened and admit that I can't remember anything. I feel groggy but not hungover. Just like I want to go back to sleep. She laughs and says it was a really wild night. We must have drank a lot because she can't remember anything either. I kind of laugh with her but I'm confused. I'm not a person who can drink well. If I drink too much, I'm sick that night and the following day, so I tend not to. I'm a really small chick, so it hits easily. But even when I've drank too much, I remember things. This time, I remember nothing after one beer. We have coffee and try to piece the night together. My roommate's sheets are all bloody because my knees are scabby and my palms and wrist are all scratched up. Internally, I'm freaking out, but I try to stay calm. She seems to think it's par for the course and for her, Maybe it is, but the bleeding, the memory loss, and then comes the part where I check my pants and yes, they are ripped at the knees. How badly does a person have to fall if their jeans rip like that and their knees? In the pocket is $15, all the money I had after my first beer. I ask Amy how much she has left and she says she owes me a bunch of drinks because she has all her money left. Maybe those guys we saw bought us drinks? Still. I don't even remember finishing the first one that I bought. After she leaves, I call my boyfriend to tell him sorry that I didn't let him know that I got home safe. He says I did call, sounded completely sober but was babbling about being afraid. He asked if he should come but I told him no, I'm in bed, I'm fine. So he didn't. I start the shift from being confused and kind of mortified thinking I drank to black out and then I began to think maybe something horrible happened. I'm home alone now and cannot remember a thing. Nothing. Not even, what's the last thing you remember? I, I just don't. Later that afternoon, Amy calls me to tell me that Lou called her to ask if I was okay and make sure that we were safe. According to Lou, Amy came running into his bar crying that we needed help. He thought she was drunk, but she ran out of his bar and he ran after her so she wouldn't run into the street. Way up the block, he saw me struggling as two guys were practically dragging me. This next part took about 10 seconds. He started to run up, but he was still a ways away. He said they were approaching a parked car. I put my hands up in a, okay, okay, gesture, and they let me stand. As one let go to open the door, I walked toward the car with the other calmly, then kicked him and took off running. And Lou met me on the way. By the time he thought to let go of me and chase them, they were in the car and taking off, and he couldn't catch up. He brought me back to the bar because Amy and I were a crying mess. My jeans were torn. I was bleeding apparently from being dragged. I kept asking him to please help me get my pants off so I could pee because I couldn't figure out the belt. Yes, the same guy I avoided at first like the plague because he skeeved me. I was asking now to take my pants down. I was drugged, obviously. I was drugged and nearly shoved into a car. I thank God and my parents' DNA that somehow in a haze, I had the mind to pretend I would cooperate and stop fighting them. I have so many questions. How come no one on the street questioned those two guys dragging a woman? My guess is, it was those clean cut guys, and they probably said I was drunk and people believed them. I don't even know what time it was. 
Maybe we were at the bar till later, before they brought us out, and the streets were clearer. Maybe they took us somewhere else first, for a while, which led me to wonder what really happened. I went for a hypnotherapy because, what if I'd been raped and had no memory of it? What if I had an STD or I was pregnant? Apparently I'm not hypnotizable. The therapist said that the fact that my underpants were still on the next morning, with no blood or tears in them, is the best assurance. So, I'm gonna hope that nothing really did happen. She did end up being right. I still have no memory of what happened. People, watch your drinks. Even if you're sitting at a table and it's right in front of you, hold it in your hand. Bring it everywhere with you and don't judge a book by its cover. I almost learned that the hard way. And after that night, Lou's became my new favorite bar in Seattle. I had tickets for a plane that crashed, killing everybody on board. On July 17, 2007, I was supposed to fly from Porto Alegre to Sao Paulo because I had taken a substitute exam that night at the university. I was still taking my degree, but I was a consultant back then too, so I had to travel a lot. My grades were not the greatest, so I was sure that I didn't have enough to be approved on one specific class. Hence, I would have to take the substitute exam to boost my grade and maybe be approved on that class. The tickets were purchased and everything was fine. On the morning of July 17, 2007, the teacher posted the grades on the system and I had enough to pass that class. Therefore, I didn't need to go anymore, so I canceled the ticket. I worked like crazy and then by 7 p.m., I opened up the news website and there were reports of a plane crash in Sao Paulo. I didn't really pay much attention until they mentioned that the flight came from Porto Alegre. I checked the flight number, my tickets, it was shocking. I'm happy and thankful I didn't take that flight, but also sorry for those who lost their lives that night. I'm a water guy. I read meters and maintain infrastructure like water lines and stuff. Most cities and towns show a water loss from month to month. We know how much water left the water plant has and we know how much got sold to the meters and flush from hydrants. Whatever doesn't get counted is the water loss. My town's water loss nearly doubled one month to a 12% loss. Something was up. There's a leak going on somewhere and we had to find it ASAP. Water costs money, and the higher the loss, the more tax dollars get spent paying for it. So we divide up the town into sections. About 40 of us split into teams of two men, and searched each section all day. My section included an abandoned water park. If you've never seen a water plant, Google it. It's like a large factory that is full of deep pools and huge pipes. The water plant hadn't been operational for about 15 years. There was no electricity and the only lighting came from a few small, dirty windows. It looked like a scene from the movies. I went in through the back door. It had rotted and falling off hinges, so we just walked right in. The ground floor was just concrete. Walkaways passed over, the huge pools of water were. They had rusty railings with life preservers hanging on them. It was eerily quiet except for our footsteps. The water was black and stagnant. The whole place smelled like an old, musty basement, and at the end of the walkway, there was a metal staircase that went down into a dry pit that had some pumps and pipes. That's where the valves were located that isolated the plant from the rest of the water system. We shined our lights down into the pit, and saw nothing that looked like it was out of place or leaking, so we turned around to head back out. My coworker had been there a few years ago, and was talking about how the plant operated. He said there was a pretty cool laboratory upstairs. So, we decided to check it out while we were still there. We went up the metal staircase to the second floor and entered the lab. It was actually pretty cool. They had all kinds of glassware and stuff still set up from the days they shut it down. It was all covered in dust and bird shit. The floor was scattered with old papers and more bird shit. I'm nosy, so I started opening file cabinets and desk drawers, looking at all the stuff they left behind. The whole place was like a time capsule. There was a wall of lockers where employees used to keep stuff. I opened each one, but remained disappointed, all empty. 
all along the other wall were the bathrooms. This plant was built in the 1920s and still had the original sinks and old time toilets. As a former plumber, I found that interesting. Beside the bathrooms was another door, and I assumed it must be a closet or something. The door was already open a few inches, so I flung it open to see what was inside. As soon as I flung the door open, a cat jumped out and made the loudest angry scream I've ever heard a cat make. The floors were concrete, so the cat was trying its best to run away, but wasn't getting much traction on the slick floor. The cat screamed, I screamed, my coworker screamed, we all jumped, and the glass broke from shit we knocked over. It was all echoing throughout this huge, empty building. After we finished shitting ourselves and realized it was just a cat, we began laughing our asses off all the way back to inside our truck. It's gotta be the most scared I've ever been in my entire life. I was already creeped out by the stagnant pools of black water inside a pitch black building. It's like the feeling you get when you watch a scary movie and you know something is about to happen. Fun times, I guess. At age 12, I started babysitting for a family friend who had three daughters ages four to seven. They lived in a cul-de-sac where nearly every home housed a young couple with children in elementary school. The neighborhood was extremely close-knit, like the 1950s American block party community. They had a communal policy on using one another's toys. Any kid could use a play structure in someone else's yard anytime without asking. Shortly after I started working in the neighborhood, they revised the rule to anytime a family is not using a babysitter to watch their kids to ensure I would not get overwhelmed supervising a swarm of kids that I wasn't paid to watch. It was more or less known when parents were going out and leaving someone else in charge of their children. I was welcome to take the girls to play in any other yard as they wanted. Their parents even gave me permission to let them play in someone else's yard or sandbox independently if I needed a short break. Being an avid babysitter's club reader, I didn't leave the girls outside unsupervised either. I would wait until someone else wanted a water or bathroom break, and then corral everyone inside just temporarily. Similarly, when the girls wanted to play in the treehouse owned by an older couple a few doors up the street, I climbed up, despite a slight fear of heights, and crouched in the little house with them, despite feelings of claustrophobia, to follow my own rules. I don't recall whether everyone inside and everyone outside together rule would precede the first odd interaction that I had with the immediate next door neighbor. But when the police questioned the girls I babysat years later, they said that nothing bad ever happened when I watched them because I set up this weird, sometimes annoying rule. One day while playing basketball with the girls in the driveway, the next door neighbor came outside in a baseball cap and sunglasses and then just sat down on his second story deck to read a paperback. I later noticed that he turned his chair about 180 degrees to face us and the basketball hoop. I couldn't really tell if he was actually looking at us. He had no reaction to me staring at him, flipping pages in the book like someone would be when they're reading. This behavior repeated every time we played basketball for the five years that I watched those girls. Eventually, I noticed him in the chair, accessories on, and I would suggest a game we go play inside or in the front yard, just out of view. The strange neighbor was familiar to me as he went to my church. I have never seen someone kneel in a pew, head bowed, and hands folded with the same intensity before or since. Once when my family was seated behind him, the priest came over to ask me to leave the children's mass because the usual person was out sick. This guy turned around and glared at me like I was personally set out to interrupt his prayer time. When I worked in the church nursery during various masses, I would often make eye contact with him as he waited in line, outside the nursery door, to use the restroom. From what I gleaned from our family friends and other people in the neighborhood, the odd basketball observer was a nice guy who gave up his apartment and job in the city to move in and care for his sick elderly mother. Since everyone thought he was great, and since he went to church, I figured I was in the wrong for finding him creepy. Even as young as 12, I was used to guys in their 40s and 50s asking me to go somewhere with them, or driving by slowly as I walked, biked, jogged, and made lewd comments to me. I figured I was projecting those experiences onto this awkward, quiet guy who was not doing anything wrong. For instance, I was certain that if this next door neighbor was a creep, he would not miss the opportunity to watch with his sunglasses on and book in hand while the kids and I went swimming each summer, but he never set foot on his deck when the kids and I donned swimsuits to play in the pool or the backyard. I was more convinced that I was just being conceited and mean. 
Then when I was 15 or 16, I caught him looking in the window as I cleaned up after movie night. The girls and I put on a film after bath time, and instead of watching it theater style in total darkness, we kept some lights on so I could braid the girls' hair. The big screen TV we used for movies was located in an addition on the house with floor to ceiling windows. Though my parents were OCD about shutting blinds and curtains when the sun went down to hopefully prevent people from seeing in, our family friends had no window treatment on the big modern windows. So when I turned off the last light in the room, a floor lamp right next to the window facing the neighbor's house, I could see into the darkness outside, where a weird man sat on his deck in a chair in line with the window I was looking through. I looked over my shoulder and realized that he had line of sight on where the girls and I sat on the floor during the movie. As I looked back towards the house, I glimpsed him hustling back inside. I would have doubted I'd seen him at all if he'd not left the chair in an unusual spot. After watching him turn the chair around to read during many basketball matches, I knew where the chair sat that night, facing the window into the family room. And that was not the chair's usual position on the deck. After that incident, I would suggest playing board games in another room or insist on watching movies theater style to ensure he could not peep on what we did at night. Once the girls were asleep, I avoided the family room entirely because I was paranoid about being watched. If I wasn't in the kitchen doing homework or reading away from all windows, I'd walk around the original first floor footprint of the house, where all the windows had curtains. The first time the parents noticed my change in routine, they insisted I could watch TV or movies in the family room, but I didn't mention anything to them because I was worried my concerns were silly and conceited. Fast forward to when I was 17. My family and I hear an evening cable news story about a man caught in our town in a police sting operation in which a woman pretended to prostitute her child. When they raided his house, the police found a ton of CP on his computer. Our family friends called a couple of weeks later. They wanted to know how I knew the young man next door to them was not safe. He was the man we heard about on TV. As they described it, the police found his blog where he wrote about his obsession with one of the girls who lived next door to him. In it, he detailed his fantasies involving her and his plans to act on them. Things like lying in the treehouse for hours, hoping to corner her when she climbed up to play alone. Many of his entries focused on taking advantage of or kidnapping the girl while the babysitter was in charge. In his head, babysitters were like the ones in old movies, talking to friends on the phone or making out with the boy they invited over instead of caring for the children. As it became clear I did neither of those things, his plans then evolved to killing the babysitter, taking the girl, and leaving the city. After talking to the girls to ensure that they were not victims, the police suggested that I might actually know something having acted the way I did. All the pieces, the frequent run-ins at church when I had children to my care, or the weird things he did when he knew I was watching the kids next door, all of them fit together cohesively. I was relieved that I was just not mean-spirited or imagining those things. The focus was not on me, but on the children, but I was not crazy. I recognized that I was not the person most at risk in this situation. But yet, to the suburb pedo, and would-be murderer. Let's never ever meet again. I have an aunt that's not blood related that moved into a house in Ohio in the early 70s. I remember, and this being my earliest memory, waking up in a crib inside that house. My mom had me there as well as we had a house we were moving into, but had two more days before we could actually move in. What I do remember is a sight that's been burned into my memory forever. I don't remember her actually putting me into bed, but I remember waking up in a very dark room. Peering down into the crib was a horrible monster with red eyes and a gaping maw with impossibly long fangs. Two horns that curved back as well, and its hands were gripping each side of the crib. The fingers were long and it had very long sharp nails. Quickly exploded into tears, crying hysterically. My mom entered the room almost immediately, turned on the light, and tried to calm me down. She was just thinking that I woke up in an unfamiliar place and was scared, and she couldn't understand why. I no longer saw that monster, but I was trying to explain what I saw, and I remember my aunt looking very worried behind her. The next day, we were shopping at Eastland Mall, and my brother and sister joined us, having returned from my grandmother's house. We went back to my aunt's house because we were going to stay there one more night with my brother and sister this time, which made me feel a little better because I was terrified of that place. When we got there, 
My aunt unlocked the front door, but it would only push in about an inch and wouldn't budge from there. My aunt was completely bewildered. She unlocked the side door and went into the garage. We all followed her through the garage and into the house, between the kitchen and the front living room, where we tried to enter before. As we all entered the living room, we were in complete shock at what we saw. Every single piece of furniture was stacked up against the front door. The couch, love seat, recliner chair, coffee table, end tables, lamps. I remember being thoroughly flummoxed, trying to piece in my young mind how this happened. My sister started crying, and my aunt called the police. They told us to exit the house and wait for them outside. When the police showed up, they walked through the whole house and saw no intruder nor any sign of forced entry. They grilled my aunt, asking her if anyone else had a set of keys or would play some kind of prank on her. She told them no, and even the police were uneasy about the situation. Like, maybe they too were being pranked. My uncle was in California for work, but my dad, who was out of town too, was due back the next day, which was comforting at the time. My other uncle, who lived nearby, came over with my older cousin and they moved all the furniture back to where it belonged. When the front door was uncovered with the last item, the couch, my cousin yelled, What the fuck? My uncle called my aunt over to the front door. Her face drained all of her blood. Sweet Jesus, she exclaimed. She hurried off to her bedroom and we all clambered into the room to look at the door. We all saw it. Three claw marks etched into the door from about halfway up to the floor. None of this really meant anything to me. I was too young to have any paranormal knowledge. My aunt returned with a hammer and nailed that cross into the door, right above where the claw scratch was. I was still super confused, and nobody would tell me why the cross was put there. My mom called my dad and explained the situation and asked us to get a hotel room. My dad thought all of this was rubbish, and being kind of tight on money, quickly told her no. My uncle agreed to stay with us there that night. My aunt and my mom, who were all visibly shaken, were all now talking in touch tones well into the evening. They put cartoons on the TV, but still, the mood, and everyone was uneasy. There was also foul odors coming and going, which made no sense. We all decided to have a big slumber party in the living room, on the floor and couches. My brother, who was 11 years old, had went into the bathroom, and as he was returning back to the living room, he started screaming. I remember wondering why I couldn't see what was actually attacking him, but his pajama pants were literally shredded off of his legs. My mom ran and grabbed him, picked him up and ran into the living room. I began crying, my sister was crying, and my aunt had a cross held up saying prayers, asking for protection. At this point, my mom had had enough. We're getting out of this place. So we all left. We did end up getting a hotel room, and my aunt got an adjoining room. We all slept fine, but we were all still traumatized, especially my poor brother. Back in the 70s, there weren't a lot of paranormal investigators and people willing to take on that type of thing. You were kind of on your own. My aunt and uncle had to move out of that house, and they sold it. And the next people who moved in didn't last very long either. It was several years before I really understood what happened there. We've always had a close relationship with my aunt who lived there. I'm guessing from all that traumatic experience that we had. There are demons in this world that are pure evil. They hate us with a passion and want nothing else but to destroy our lives. I've had a number of scares in my life, but this one comes to mind for some reason. In the 80s, I took a number of solo wilderness trips. The first was because everyone else who was going had to back out in the weeks leading up to it, and I went anyway. I found the experience exhilarating and went on several others alone for that reason. The story is about the last one. I was in the Wind River Mountains of Wyoming. It was a place I had trekked through many times and the particular loop I was on was the most familiar part of the area for me. I was well equipped, very experienced and as always, I carried a Ruger 357 Magnum. Grizzlies had not yet returned that far down into the winds in great numbers so the pistol was mostly insurance against mountain lions, black bears, or any two-legged varmints that I might encounter. And this story involves the latter. And so at this point, I want to mention a couple of things that salinate to the story. First, one thing I learned on solo treks is that a day in or so, one gets this hyper-awareness that borders on ESP when you're alone in the wilderness. 
On these kind of trips, I'd be moving along with my attention, would be drawn in one direction. 30 or 45 minutes later, another group of hikers or horse packers would appear. My awareness of their presence would occur long before I could possibly have seen or heard them. I also saw far more animals on solo trips than when I was with others, partly because it was quieter when you're alone, but I believe it was also because of the heightened sense of awareness that came with the profound solitude. I've read about the same phenomenon in books about trappers who went out west alone, and books written by Native Americans. The other point is that, if one spends much time up in the Rocky Mountains, in the national forests, one runs into wilderness versions of street people from time to time. Every so often on backpacking trips, the group I was in would encounter folks who had clearly been there for a great deal of time. Their clothing and gear would be dirty, tattered and worn. They themselves would be grimy and blackened from constant exposure to sun and campfire smoke with thick, with evergreen pitch interlaid with dust from the trails. They almost always carried guns and said very little. They often were unsettling because they would eye my group's relatively new gear avidly. Once in a particular, a group of three were latently hostile, although nothing came of it, so back to the story at hand. It was noon on day three of a seven loop when I became aware that I was being followed. My solo loops generally stayed on the trails and this one had thus far. That afternoon, I kept stopping and watching my back trail, expecting a string of faster moving horse packers to overtake me. I met several going out, but surprisingly, none overtaking me heading in. As it drew into late afternoon, I moved off the trail and climbed up onto a rocky ridge where I took cover and watched. Part of me felt foolish and paranoid, just as I started to chide myself for being paranoid. He appeared. Ragged, thin, and sun-blackened, the scarecrow of a man came slipping down the trail, stopping ever so often to look ahead through a pair of battered binoculars. I was looking back at him through a pair of binoculars so I could see him in detail. As mentioned, he was gaunt, disheveled, and smoke-grimed. It was impossible to guess his age. He wore a felt-brimmed hat, much like mine, but in far worse shape. His gear and clothing were tattered. He had what appeared to be a worn Ruger, a 1022 semi-automatic rifle strapped to his backpack. I don't know if he saw sunlight off my binos or if he had the same aforementioned heightened senses, but he didn't look at nor near where I lay hidden, but he was out of sight as the trail cut into a bit of heavy brush. He didn't reappear, but I knew he was there somewhere watching. I wasn't completely convinced that he was following me but I quietly ghosted through the rocks and brush until I was over the ridge and into the shadows. I had about three hours until total darkness. I knew where I was from having trekked in this area half a dozen times before over the years and decided to go off the trail, bushwhacking as it's called. Instead of going down the ridge and following the trail, I cut straight across it and snuck across country out about three miles. I was always quiet on wilderness trips, but now I was sneaking around like I was hunting for deer elk. Still feeling a little foolish, but I was trusting my gut. I eventually swung parallel to the trail, but was several more miles wide of it. My hope was to eventually rejoin the trail, making the loop in the next day or so with this guy ahead of me instead of behind. I climbed a second rocky ridge, keeping cover until I found a shoulder screen from sight in rocks and trees. I had never made campfires on my trips, preferably. I use a backpacking stove. I was invisible. After dinner, I stood in the darkness and looked over the way I'd came. Off the distance, maybe a mile or so down in the valley, I could make out the faint light of a tiny campfire. Surely that's not him. He couldn't have known I went off trail, I thought to myself. I checked the loads in my pistol before I rolled into my sleeping bag bivy sack. My plan was to start out the next day as soon as there was enough pre-dawn light to safely travel. I wanted to put more distance between me and this guy. Him being in front of me was out of the question. I knew somehow that for whatever the reason, I was now roughly 24 miles on foot from my car and was being followed. I woke up at 0400 in pitch blackness. Dawn was at least two and a half hours away, this being late August. Glassing in his direction, I saw nothing but the dark shapes of the mountains around me. His campfire was burned out. As soon as there was enough pre-dawn light gray to navigate, I set off. I was traveling in a wider version of my planned trail loop. This threatened to add another day to the trip. 
but I had enough extra food. I'd given myself a two-day cushion of vacation time. I hadn't actually seen him in the last couple of times I looked back that morning. But I'd seen the glint of reflective light, as if off his binoculars while he looked after me. Although I wasn't as relaxed as previous trips, I felt this perverse thrill. I liked the idea of trying to throw someone off my trail like an 1840s mountain man trying to elude a Shoshone war party. In my mind, he'd lose interest and go on his own way when he couldn't find me. I hiked hard, but quiet. My internal frame pack and wind jacket were dark green, and my wool pants were slate gray, so I blended in to the rugged Wind River backcountry well. I concentrated on covering as much ground as possible while using the terrain to hide my progress. I stuck to rocky dry ground to keep from leaving boot prints. I ate on the move. Lunch was homemade jerky and canteen water. I could still sense this fucker's presence behind me. How far, I didn't know. Near dusk, I hiked up and made a hidden camp in a crevice in a huge boulder field that covered the shoulder of one of the peaks. I was at about 11,000 feet with the continental divide scarcely two miles above me to the east. I had one more day of hiking south-southwest before turning due west for two days. Then I'd be back at the trailhead and civilization. As I did the previous night, I scanned back the way I came through my binoculars. A stab of pure fear bit into my gut. Less than three quarters of a mile down slope, I could easily see the flicker of a small campfire. Even worse, I saw the intermittent glow of what was obviously a cigarette or a cigar being spoked, not 200 yards down below me. This was no longer any fun. It was the same motherfucker, and there was no doubt that he was tracking me. I was being stalked in a game of cat and mouse deep into the darkest chunk of wilderness in the lower 48 states. I packed up everything but my sleeping bag, my ground pad, and my pistol, and decided what needed to be done, and set my alarm for 0200 and slept fitfully. My watch beeped almost inaudibly at 0200 and I was awake instantly. The full moon was just overhead and the visibility was good. Up near the divide in the alpine valley I was in, it was mostly rocks with only the occasional scrubby evergreen. Holding my pistol in one hand, I began to carefully move down the boulder field toward where I figured his camp would be. The campfire was burned down, but I noted its position in regard to the adjacent mountain the evening before. After 45 minutes of steady progress, I didn't need the landmarks. I could hear his low rhythmic snores, and I smelled the remains of his campfire as I crept up on his camp. 20 minutes later, I was perched on a rocky outcropping 10 feet above his sleeping form. He, like me, was sleeping out underneath the stars. I had enough moonlight to barely recognize him. I sat and considered my next move. I rejected the idea of waking him up at gunpoint. I couldn't see his rifle meaning it was probably laying next to him. Scaring him awake and into a nighttime gunfight seemed a little too extreme. After all, it wasn't illegal for him to follow me. This was public land, and he had not done anything overtly threatening. I needed to let him know that I knew he was following me, and it was starting to creep me out and piss me off. Then I had it. I crept up nine yards away, keeping the outcropping between us, I pulled out the small spiral notebook and pencil I carried from my fanny pack. Pen light in my mouth, I wrote, I spotted you the day before yesterday. I know you were following me, but I don't know why. It's starting to piss me off. Stop tomorrow or this might get ugly. I could have got you tonight. Move elsewhere and leave me alone. I quietly opened the cylinder on my pistol and carefully removed one shell. Creeping back quietly, I left the note in the shell in front of his camp, weighed down by three small rocks with the three quarters of the note sticking out. It was 0430 by the time I made it back to my camp, and he never stopped snoring as I left. I started out by flashlight, but almost immediately, that proved to be foolishly perilous. With the moon nearly down, the flashlight was inadequate. I made scarcely one quarter of a mile off the shoulder of the mountain before deciding to wait until pre-dawn to start again. I dozed fitfully as dark clouds loomed in the north, and a cold wind came up from the same direction. Late August near Timberline in the Wyoming high country can easily go from late summer to winter and back again in the span of a day or two. I pulled out my wool overshirt and put it on underneath my windbreaker. 
An hour before sunrise, I saw his campfire flare up, and I walked carefully about 200 yards that way, cut my hands and yelled, I'm making hot oatmeal with honey in a minute. I'll make a bowl out of aluminum foil and leave you some if you want it. After a pause, I barely heard him reply. I just ate, I yelled back. Then I'm leaving. I left a note outside your camp between us. You ought to read it. I boiled water, had oatmeal and coffee, packed up my gear, and set out again. Instead of looping gradually back toward the trail, I cut sharply west. This trip was over. I wasn't having fun anymore. In a repeat of the previous day, I hiked hard. This time, however, I stopped and ate a hot lunch. It was cold, windy, and snow flurries fell off and on. By nightfall, I couldn't sense him back there. That night, I couldn't see a campfire behind me. He needed one wherever he was because it snowed intermittently all night. By dawn, my bivy sack and the other ground were covered by a dusting of dry snow. That blustery day and the next, other than a couple of backpacking parties heading in on foot or by horseback, I was alone. I hit the trailhead in my car by early evening on day six. I got on the road straight away and drove 150 miles east before stopping at Guernsey State Park in eastern Wyoming. I slept four or five hours in the car and then started out again. In the early morning a day later, I rolled back into Dallas. The experience became a dim memory that only pops into my mind every now and then. Usually, it comes up as a scary campfire tale. To this day, I can't begin to fathom why that guy followed me. Was he looking to finally get somewhere where he could ambush me so he could take my gear and my money? That's very possible. He steadily moved closer during the time that he followed me. He wasn't very careful about hiding his campfires, though. Could be he took me for a greenhorn who wouldn't notice him back behind me. It's also possible that he could have been tired being up there alone for so long, but lacked enough social skills to approach me all the way. Regardless, being tracked by someone through some of the most remote wilderness in the U.S. outside of Alaska was very frightening, to say the least. Since then, I've never gone on a solo trip again. I still go very well armed. It's sad, because other than that last trip, I really enjoyed the experience of trekking all alone, inside the wilderness. This story certainly scared me when I read it for the first time. My uncle told me this story, his personal experience with his friend Ronnie one day. Ronnie was browsing on the internet. He read a story about a certain suspension bridge that was located close to his home. The website had plenty of pictures of the bridge and the surrounding area. The next time he met my uncle, he told him about the bridge. It was an old suspension bridge that crossed over a deep gorge, and for some unknown reason, it was a place that was very notorious for suicides. Every single year, at least five or ten people would throw themselves off that bridge and died, and nobody could explain why. They said that that spot was haunted by the ghosts of all the people who had committed suicide there. When my uncle went home that evening, he decided that he had to check out this bridge, and he desperately wanted to see a ghost. So that very night, he set out for the mountains where the bridge was located. It took him an hour and a half to get there. It was almost midnight when he arrived at the bridge and there was not a single person around. It was dark and deathly quiet. The atmosphere was so spooky and ominous that it sent a chill down his spine. People just fool others about this place, he muttered to himself as he cautiously walked to the edge of the gorge and then peered down into its depths. He began thinking about all the people who had thrown themselves down into that inky blackness. It was all so fascinating that he felt forced to tell his friend Ronnie all about it so he pulled out his cell phone to call him. However, he was so high up in the mountains, he couldn't get any reception. Glancing around, my uncle noticed that there was a phone booth standing nearby. He went inside and put some coins in the slot and then dialed Ronnie's number. Hello, Ronnie. I'm at the bridge you told me about earlier. Why don't you come join me? It's pleasant and quiet here. Why not? Ronnie replied. Wait there, I'll be there soon. By the way, where are you calling me from? My uncle laughed. Oh, it's... My phone is out of range, so I'm calling you from a payphone. Ronnie was confused. Payphone? There's no payphone there. If there was any, I would have definitely seen it on one of those photos. Bullshit. There's a payphone on the way to the bridge. 
Don't delay. There are people waiting outside for their turn. As soon as he said this, Ronnie shouted. No. Do not move from there. I know that place and I'm coming in 15 minutes. Just stay inside the payphone and do not put the phone down. What happened? Just promise me that you won't move from there. Whatever others say, just please don't move from there. When his friend hung up, my uncle felt a wave of fear envelop him. Thankfully, he didn't put his phone down, and the people outside of the booth were just staring at him the whole time. The look in their eyes sent a shiver down his spine once more. Fifteen minutes later, when Ronnie arrived at that suspension bridge, he found his friend, standing at the very edge of the bridge. He was holding his cell phone against his ear, and he had no clue what he was doing. There was no phone booth, and no line of people waiting to use that phone. If he had moved an inch, he would have fallen off the edge and died. This happened about a year ago. I was on Grinder looking for either fun dates or new friendships. One day, I was scrolling and I received a new message from a guy who we'll call Brian. I took a look at some of his profile pictures, read his bio, and decided that I was kind of interested in him. We start to message back and forth, and he seemed to be really kind and a charismatic guy who really knew how to hold a conversation, something that is very hard to come by on that app. A few days went by. We eventually exchanged numbers, and he seemed nice enough, and I wanted to see if he was as great in person as he was over a text message. So I asked him if he wanted to go on a date with me, and he very happily agreed. So, we schedule a date, and the plan was that I was going to drive to his place, pick him up, we grabbed some lattes at my favorite local coffee shop. It was around 6 p.m., and I sent him a text message to tell him that I was leaving my house, to which he responded with a quaint, can't wait to meet you. I smiled at his supposed kindness. Then, in the middle of driving to his house, I receive a phone call from him, so I pick it up. And the conversation went mostly as follows. Hey, Brian, what's up? Hey, quick change of plans. I'm feeling tired and I kind of would rather not go out. Would you be okay with staying at my place? We can watch some shows and order some takeout. Uh, I mean, that's not really what I had in mind. I'd like to go out and do things on a first date. Uh, don't be such a buzzkill. Just come over. I won't show you a bad time. As he spoke on the phone, I got a really strange feeling in my gut. Like something was wrong about how he talked to me. Before I met him, I imagined his voice and inflections to sound a lot more lighthearted because the way we texted was very whimsical and fun. But over the phone, he talked as if he was in a hurry. Perhaps slightly frantic. However, despite my gut feeling, I decided that I would accept his offer. Maybe he was just tired or stressed from a work day. So there I was, pulling into his driveway, and he greeted me at his door. He looked like his pictures. He was very handsome. He was wearing fashionable glasses, and his dark hair contrasted with his light skin. We go inside, and I was greeted by one of his roommates who was playing Dark Souls in the living room. I wanted to be polite, so I approached the roommate and introduced myself. I didn't want to come off as rude to Brian, just in case this date ended up going really well. While I'm talking with his roommate, Brian calls my name and beckons me to walk inside his bedroom. I politely excuse myself and follow Brian into his room. Now, when I walk inside, I saw something straight out of a fucking no sleep story. Only this was real and it was right in front of me. There were candles lit all around, and when I got a closer look, I noticed that there were several altars scattered across the room. Effigies of ancient looking figures, animal bones, Jars with unidentifiable liquids inside. Some sort of dagger next to a cat skull. The whole shebang. I don't remember all the altars, but I do remember a couple. One of them was on the floor, and there was a glass container that held some sort of yellow liquid with animal skulls surrounding the container. Another altar was on a shelf next to his bed, and this one had candles surrounding some sort of doll with its eyes sewn shut and hands missing. Now that one was creepy and super bizarre. A part of me was telling me to nope the fuck out of there immediately, but I thought maybe I was just overreacting to someone's religious choices. I didn't know much about cult religions, so I didn't want to assume that this guy had any malintent. Plus, 
I can be a little reactive at times, so I decided to stay and go along with the ride. When we walked into his room, I wanted to calm my nerves, and because I have a really curious mind, I decided to ask Brian what these altars were, and he told me that he'd tell me more about it later. A weird response, but again, I brushed it off my shoulders, thinking that he just might be eccentric. I can be a little weird too, so I tried to be empathetic and understanding. Then I point to one of the altars and ask about it. He frowns at me and scowls. Don't touch that! His voice startled me. His intense inflections, paired with his angry expression, sent a lump straight to my throat, and I felt threatened. I was almost four feet away from the altar, not even close to touching it, yet he just yelled at me like a father yelling at his kid to stop messing around at church. I was confused and thinking that I'd done something wrong, so I apologized. In the blink of an eye, that scowl turned back into a smile. He kindly invited me to sit with him and watch the show. What really weirded me out was the fact that his smile looked and felt genuine. He had just gotten angry, but all of a sudden, he didn't care and served me up a really kind disposition. I was unsure of how to process what had just happened, so I decided to sit down with him. He seemed to be acting pretty normal once this ordeal had happened. We started to talk about ourselves. After some time, he became really sweet and soft-spoken, similar to how he was over text message, and we were able to share some stories about our own lives. It was starting to feel like an actual first date. My nerves subsided a bit. I was probably just overthinking everything else, right? Then he turns on his TV. Now, mind you, I was still a little freaked out by this random outburst, so I was definitely still on my guard. I offered to invite his roommate to come hang out with us. Brian's roommate seemed like an average Joe when I met him, so I just wanted someone else to be there to act as a sort of buffer. I wanted to see how he would act around other people, but when I gave him my idea, he immediately shut me down, and his personality switched from easygoing to stressed and angry. He started cussing out his roommate to me, making it clear that he absolutely hated him. The switch was so jarring, I began to panic once more. Then he changed the subject and started to talk about me said that he found me really attractive, and in the process, his fingers started to graze my thighs. I needed a second to collect myself though, so I excused myself to get some water. When I stood up, he immediately slapped my ass and told me not to take too long. I walked out and closed the door behind me. I started to make my way to the kitchen, and I was hoping to chat with his roommate on the way to see if I could ask about Brian. But he was now asleep on the living room couch, so I just made a beeline to the cabinets in search of a cup. I thought about walking out and driving home because I didn't really appreciate the sudden touchiness, but I started to get paranoid. He had all those altars, and he didn't tell me what they were for. I've seen some horror films about the occult, and I truly had no idea what this guy was capable of. Yeah, he was sweet at times, but he was showing me some really aggressive behavior. Who's to say that this guy isn't capable of doing some kind of voodoo curse on me? Dramatic, I know, but you can never really be too sure. So I grabbed my water and cautiously headed back to his room. When I walked back inside, I saw him sitting on the couch with his legs crisscrossed and his eyes closed. When I approached him, I saw his mouth moving, but didn't hear anything coming from it. Weirded out by this, I called his name, and he didn't respond. Strange called his name a second time. He opened up his eyes, uncrossed his legs, and went back to watching TV, all without addressing what he was doing. What the fuck? I was getting really worried, but I did what I could to keep my cool. I didn't want to do anything to upset him or make him lose his cool. I sat next to him on the couch, and we started talking again. But once again, he was completely normal. Unnervingly normal. It was like I was sitting in the room with a real-life Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, except Brian was able to switch between them seamlessly. I needed to do something, but what was I supposed to do? I couldn't call him out because he might lash out in some malicious way, but I also didn't want to stay because he was freaking me the hell out. I ended up just staying, and I tried to devise some sort of plan to get out of there without making him angry. At some point, he gets up to grab his phone, I thought I might try dishing out the same kind of ass crap that he gave to me when I went to get water. Maybe it would release the tension that I was feeling. And maybe he'd like it and it'd make him less aggressive. 
Regardless, I wanted to try something. I made my move and gave him a cheeky ass grab. Immediately, he turned around and swatted my hand away and lunged at me. His hand was curled up in a fist, and he flung it towards my face. His fist was inches away from making contact with my right cheek, but stopped mid-punch. In that moment, I saw that his eyes were wide open. His facial expressions was cold and emotionless. He was right in my face. My heart was beating so fast that I felt like it was seconds away from an aneurysm. He looked directly at me, and my eyes stared back. At that moment, I felt like prey to his predator. He uncurled his fist, put his icy hands on both sides of my face, and started to squeeze. You're just so cute. He pulled me in and forced a kiss. I absolutely did not want to kiss him, but I was paralyzed and could not will myself to push him away. His words were patronizing, sort of like he was talking to a dog, and it even felt more like this because he had just scrunched my face against his. I felt disgusting kissing someone who had almost punched me in the face, but there was nothing I could do in that moment. Again, I did not want to risk pissing him off. He slowly pulled away and gave me another sweet smile and then sat down pretending that nothing had just happened, and started staring back at the TV. Yep, I'm over this, completely. His behavior had become more erratic and more unpredictable. His room was fucking creepy as shit, and he clearly had associations with some sort of cult. And frankly, he was scaring me. I eventually decided that I'd rather deal with the voodoo-looking altars later on, than stay in his house and have to put up with the immediate danger. So I snapped myself out of my anxiety-induced trance, stood up and told him that I was starting to get sick and wanted to go home. He got angry, tried to convince me to stay the night, but I gathered my courage and insisted that it was time for me to leave. He begrudgingly let me, but it was clear that my decision pissed him off, but I didn't care anymore. I said my goodbyes and told him that I'd text him later, thinking, fuck that, to myself while doing so. I got to my car, drove home shaking and sweating. Felt relieved to get out of there, but nervous that he actually might try to do something. The uncertainty of it all is what truly shakes me up, but thankfully, no actual harm came to me. Who knows what would have happened if I actually stayed, though. I blocked Brian's number, as well as his grinder profile, and even now, I keep my own photos private. I haven't heard from him since, and I still fear that he's going to try to come after me somehow. So to Brian... The erratic occultist? Let's never meet again. Okay guys, yesterday was probably one of the worst days I've ever endured, and it all started with a phone call at about 7am. I picked up my phone to see who was calling me so early. But since I didn't recognize the number, I just put it on silent and fell back asleep. When I woke up again three hours later, I saw that I had 12 missed calls and 8 new voicemails. Panic started to set in as I thought something horrible had happened to one of my family members. As I looked through all the missed numbers though, I realized that I didn't know who any of these people were. I thought that was really strange since if something bad had happened to a family member, I should at least recognize one of these numbers. Things got weirder as I heard the first voicemail. Hi, I was just giving you a call about the house you have for sale. I saw the Craigslist ad and was hoping to figure out a time I could be given a walkthrough. Just give me a call back, thanks. I figured that was the wrong number and played the next one. Yeah, hi. I was calling about the house for sale on Craigslist. If you could, give me a call back. I'd really like to know some more stuff about those murders before I take a walkthrough. Thanks and have a nice day. After hearing the second voicemail, I was really starting to wonder what the hell is going on here. The other six voicemails were all pretty much the same thing, inquiring about setting up a walkthrough and wanting to know about these quote unquote murders. After I finished listening to the last one, I needed to find out what the fuck is going on. I called the last number to leave a voicemail and a woman answered. When I asked her about the house she was calling about, she said there was an ad on Craigslist offering a house for dirt cheap but it was only so cheap because the post said that a couple had been murdered inside the house. I asked her if she could text me the link and she assured me that she would. A few minutes later, my phone buzzed and I saw her number pop up on its screen. 
I had no idea what I was in store for by clicking on that link. So when the web page opened, the coldest chill I've ever felt shot down my spine. I saw a picture of my house on Craigslist for sale. What made it worse was it was the picture that had been taken within the last week. You could see the pumpkin that I carved last weekend. And then I read the posting description. I have this sweet little home that I'm putting up for sale. It's located in this town. Just a hop, skip, and a jump away from the city. Enjoy all the seclusion and privacy that this house will bring you. My asking price is $25,000. Disclosure. There is a reason I'm asking basically nothing for my house. The previous couple who lived there, a young man and a woman, were murdered in the house about a year ago. I figured it would get out in the open now so that I'm only contacted by people who are not bothered by this. Don't let this little mishap dissuade you though. The neighborhood is very safe. I promise. You can call, then they listed my name and number at any time, day or night. I never sleep and we can set a time to take a walkthrough of my house. I look forward to hearing from you soon, with a winky face. I felt like I'd been socked in the gut. What the f is going on? How did they know my number, my name? I immediately called my girlfriend over to see. I could see the horror set in on her face as she looked through the ad. I don't think I could feel any worse until she pointed out how our car was in the picture. We were in the house when someone took these pictures. I immediately called the police to figure out what the hell to do. They informed me that I should immediately contact Craigslist to remove the posting. Other than that, there was nothing really we could do at the moment. The only crime that had technically been committed would be trespassing, but since whoever took that picture wasn't on our property anymore, it really couldn't do anything else. I'm freaking the hell out. My girlfriend was on the phone with her mom in hysterics for most of the day yesterday. Today. We've just been on constant alert. Every sound we hear makes us jump. I think the worst part is, I know there's really nothing I can do. I feel so violated and so completely helpless. When I was 21, I transferred to a college in San Francisco. I checked out a room for rent on Craigslist. It was a really nice two bedroom apartment. The rent was cheap and close to campus, so it was kind of the ideal spot. The girl who lived there was 29 and her name was Beth. She was tall and wide and she had jet black hair and wore pale makeup. She seemed nice, although a little quiet, but she seemed to like me and agreed to let me move in. So, so far so good. My first night there, we went out for pizza. And that's when I could tell there's something a little bit off with her. Throughout dinner, she kept telling me how much I looked like Shia LaBeouf. I didn't know what to say, so I just shrugged it off with, uh, thanks? I mean, I looked nothing like Shia LaBeouf, so it just didn't make any sense to me. When we got back home, she asked if I'd seen her room yet. I said no, and she took me to see it. Shocking. Her walls were completely covered in posters of Shia LaBeouf. She even had printed out photos of him all over her mirror. She owned all of his movies. I really didn't know what to make of all this. It was definitely creepy. And the whole night, she'd been saying how I look like him, and now it's obvious to me that she's completely obsessed with the guy. A few weeks passed. I never really saw her that much. We didn't spend much time together really at all. She would come home from work and practically run into her room, and she would spend most of the night in there. She had this creepy high-pitched giggle, and I would hear her giggling through the walls at night. I wondered what the hell she could possibly be doing. Occasionally, she would come out of her room and talk for like maybe two minutes, and she would always be slurring her words, so I suspected she was drinking a lot. And sometimes, she wouldn't say anything. She would just stand in the hallway and watch me through the living room. I would turn and see her and be surprised and say, Um, hello, Beth. And then there would be this long, awkward pause, and she would give out her creepy, high-pitched giggle. It was very uncomfortable being around her. She gave me the chills. One night, I woke up at around 2 a.m. because I heard what sounded like the front door being unlocked. I came out of my bedroom, and all the lights were off. But I could still see Beth standing at the front door. She had her face against it, and she was turning the lock back and forth, over and over again. And every time she turned the bolt, she mumbled my name. 
Max Barker. Max Barker. Max Barker. Seeing her standing in the dark, mumbling my name, really freaked me out. It doesn't help that she looks like a bigger version of the girl from the ring. I just quietly went back to my room and tried to go back to sleep. One night, I was watching Gladiator, and she fumbled out of her room and turned on the living room light, forcing me to pause the movie, which was really annoying. Then she asked if I wanted to hear about her ex-boyfriend. It was an uneasy segue into the topic, but I just said sure, then awkwardly sat back to listen. Ten minutes into her story and she was so riled up. She was screaming at the top of her lungs about their breakup. And I was worried that the neighbors were going to call the cops. And she wasn't listening to me when I asked her to please lower the volume. I missed all of her screaming. One thing she said really freaked me out. She was in such a fit and yelled, I'll slit his fucking throat. That was a big game changer. Suddenly, I had no idea what this girl was capable of. She really and was practically just a stranger, and everything I'd seen thus far was becoming alarmingly disturbing. After a few more minutes, she told me thank you for listening, and then started doing her giggle once more. I got out of there pretty fast and went to my room to go to sleep. I had a really uneasy feeling about being in the house with her now, and what's worse, there's no lock on my bedroom door. I pushed the edge of my dresser in front of it to act as a little barricade. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of my dresser scraping against the floor. Beth was pushing the door open. I turned on my light, shouting at her to stop. I could see her through the opening of the door. She was so drunk and had this insane look in her eyes. I pushed the door closed and yelled at her to go back to bed. I could hear her walk back to her room, but I couldn't tell if she fell back asleep. The next morning when I went out into the hallway, my heart dropped. I saw one of her steak knives was on the floor by my door. I got goosebumps all over my arm. And all I could think about was when she said she would slit her ex-boyfriend's throat. I confronted her about it, and she said she didn't even remember trying to push my door open. She said she didn't even remember telling me about her ex-boyfriend. I've had enough. My lease was month to month, so I found a new spot and moved out. About a month after I moved out, she contacted me. I was at the movies and my phone was off. When I got out, I turned my phone on. And to my shock, I received about 40 plus text messages that she'd sent me over the past two hours. They were all just insane texts that ranged from everything in between, Hi, how are you? To, I fucking hate you. It was insane. I didn't respond and I never heard from her again. I always wonder, if I hadn't set my dresser in front of my door, would she have quietly come into my room and slit my throat? Yeah, still freaks me out, man. Okay guys, yesterday was probably one of the worst days I've ever endured, and it all started with a phone call at about 7am. I picked up my phone to see who was calling me so early. But since I didn't recognize the number, I just put it on silent and fell back asleep. When I woke up again three hours later, I saw that I had 12 missed calls and 8 new voicemails. Panic started to set in as I thought something horrible had happened to one of my family members. As I looked through all the missed numbers though, I realized that I didn't know who any of these people were. I thought that was really strange since if something bad had happened to a family member, I should at least recognize one of these numbers. Things got weirder as I heard the first voicemail. Hi, I was just giving you a call about the house you have for sale. I saw the Craigslist ad and was hoping to figure out a time I could be given a walkthrough. Just give me a call back, thanks. I figured that was the wrong number and played the next one. Yeah, hi. I was calling about the house for sale on Craigslist. If you could, give me a call back. I'd really like to know some more stuff about those murders before I take a walkthrough. Thanks and have a nice day. After hearing the second voicemail, I was really starting to wonder what the hell is going on here. The other six voicemails were all pretty much the same thing, inquiring about setting up a walkthrough and wanting to know about these quote unquote murders. After I finished listening to the last one, I needed to find out what the fuck is going on. I called the last number to leave a voicemail and a woman answered. 
When I asked her about the house she was calling about, she said there was an ad on Craigslist offering a house for dirt cheap, but it was only so cheap because the post said that a couple had been murdered inside the house. I asked her if she could text me the link and she assured me that she would. A few minutes later, my phone buzzed and I saw her number pop up on its screen. I had no idea what I was in store for by clicking on that link. So when the webpage opened, the coldest chill I've ever felt shot down my spine. I saw a picture of my house on Craigslist for sale. What made it worse was it was the picture that had been taken within the last week. You could see the pumpkin that I carved last weekend. And then I read the posting description. I have this sweet little home that I'm putting up for sale. It's located in this town. Just a hop, skip, and a jump away from the city. Enjoy all the seclusion and privacy that this house will bring you. My asking price is $25,000. Disclosure. There is a reason I'm asking basically nothing for my house. The previous couple who lived there, a young man and a woman, were murdered in the house about a year ago. I figured it would get out in the open now so that I'm only contacted by people who are not bothered by this. Don't let this little mishap dissuade you though. The neighborhood is very safe. I promise. You can call. Then they listed my name and number at any time, day or night. I never sleep and we can set a time to take a walkthrough of my house. I look forward to hearing from you soon, with a winky face. I felt like I'd been socked in the gut. What the f is going on? How did they know my number, my name? I immediately called my girlfriend over to see. I could see the horror set in on her face as she looked through the ad. I don't think I could feel any worse until she pointed out how our car was in the picture. We were in the house when someone took these pictures. I immediately called the police to figure out what the hell to do. They informed me that I should immediately contact Craigslist to remove the posting. Other than that, there was nothing really we could do at the moment. The only crime that had technically been committed would be trespassing, but since whoever took that picture wasn't on our property anymore, they really couldn't do anything else. I'm freaking the hell out. My girlfriend was on the phone with her mom in hysterics for most of the day yesterday. Today. We've just been on constant alert. Every sound we hear makes us jump. I think the worst part is, I know there's really nothing I can do. I feel so violated and so completely helpless. I was new to a big city and decided I didn't need my car anymore. So I listed my six-year-old Honda Accord. A fairly normal, well-dressed man comes over to see it after a few phone calls back and forth about it. He's in his early 40s and his name is James. He claimed he's buying it for his daughter in college. I always have my guard up when I'm dealing with strangers, but so far, James is personable and seems legitimate. He test drives it with me. He does a thorough inspection. He negotiates the price with me for a while he asked me to hold the car for two days so he can get the money and come pick it up. I agree. A two-day hold where I won't sell it to someone else. Two days later, James follows up and we meet up again. It's a normal day, normal neighborhood, in an urban city. James and I test drive the car one more time. He gives me a Chase Bank cashier's check, which I said was fine. I tell him he needs to come to the bank with me to cash this check and to get the title notarized over to him. This is when he starts acting nervous. We're pulled over on the side of the street discussing this. James is in the driver's seat and me as a passenger. I figured if he was going to steal my car, he would have done so two days earlier. So at this point, I'm fairly comfortable with the guy. He asked me to do one more car inspection with him, then we'll go to the bank. I agree, but I'm set on doing the transaction at the bank. As we both get out to inspect the car once again, he jumps back in and floors it as I try to get back in with him. He pulls away quicker than I can react, the passenger door wide open. I try to run after him, then realize I'm not as fast as a car. There are bystanders and I hysterically ask someone to call 911. Thankfully one guy does. I had my phone, but my adrenaline was through the roof and I didn't even think of it in the moment. As I'm on the stranger's phone with dispatch. An undercover cop car with two officers pulls out of an alley five feet from me. I wave them down and hysterically explain my story. They tell me to hop in the back of the car, to which I do. I implore them to hurry and we can catch this guy. He just drove off. 
I explain the car, the plate, everything. They assure me that they will not go on a high-speed chase with me in the car, but will radio it in to surrounding officers, which they do. The guy does end up getting away, and the officers drop me back off at the police station to file a report. I file an insurance claim too, and I'm so mad at myself for letting this happen. I suppose it's better than if I was in the car with this guy, but I'm still mad. Of course, James' the cell phone doesn't work. It was a burner. I go through insurance and their protocols to ensure that I'm not committing fraud for about three months or so. The week I'm supposed to get paid, I get a call from the police. They found my car, three states over. James was working with a partner in crime. I don't remember his name, so let's call him Dickface. James stole the car and gave it to Dickface to sell so it wasn't traceable back to James. And Dickface would have plausible deniability if he was ever questioned. Well, Dickface sold my car to an average Joe who actually did have a daughter in college who needed it. The daughter tried to register a new car at the DMV and it came up with stolen. So the cops arranged for me, average Joe, and Dickface to meet up with them at the station for a little chat. Dickface denies any involvement with James, but agrees to give us the money back that Average Joe paid him, if he can just leave without any problems, so we all agree to this. Average Joe and I say his daughter can keep the car, and I'll take the money from Dickface. So, eventually I did get paid for my car, but this whole experience sucked, and it was very stressful. And since then, I have bought and sold cars on Craigslist again. So I guess no lesson was really learned, except... Now I take a photo of the driver's license of all the people I interact with at the start.